Welcome back to our module Sustainable Biopolymers. In the today's lecture, I would like to discuss the challenges of the bioplastic life cycle. So, thinking about using products from renewable resources, bring them into application, dealing with the waste, and ideally having that in a sustainable manner. There are quite some challenges, as you can imagine, and challenges we have partially solved and we still also have to work on. Just as a reminder, the amount of polymers of plastics produced per year is enormous and the growth rate is enormous too. 270 million tons were produced in 2010. In 2017 it was already 320 2 million tons of plastic, of which only 2 million, we mentioned that before, less than 1% are bioplastics, biopolymers. So the challenge is huge. And if you look at the recent bioplastic global production capacities, then you see that it's divided again in our um, separation in our definition of biodegradable and bio-based non-biodegradable plastics. These are the drop-in uh, plastics, polymers we discussed, the bio-PE, bio-PET. And they are a little bit dominating uh, the market, while the biodegradable uh, is still roughly 50%. And the development and the forecast looks good, so we should think about the possibilities of these new materials and about the new synthesis routes. Then we have to look into more detail how the market looks in 2017. Roughly 50% is the drop-in solutions, especially PET, we have PA and PE. So bio-based, non-biodegradable as drop-ins. But we have also the possibilities of renewable resource based and biopolymers which are biodegradable, starch blend are long term on the market. PLA has quite some dynamics in it for uh, especially that we use packaging material, polylactic acid again. There's in the academic literature a lot on polyhydroxyalkanoate. These are polyesters discussed for decades but the market share is low. The potential is high, but it requires a lot of research, also in material sciences, but also on reducing the cost of the production and then on the entire value chain we envision. And this is very similar, such a life cycle of a bioplastic and of a conventional plastic. The real difference is it's either crude oil based or renewable resource based. But then we have our uh, plastic, we, we produce our products, we ideally reuse use our um, products we uh, synthesized and then we have a good disposable, disposal strategy. If you would use bioplastics, biopolymers, you would reduce the dependency on oil, so you would reduce the greenhouse gas emission and ideally also the entire waste stream. Again, the challenge is enormous. In the EU alone, plastic waste are 25 million tons, at least 60% uh, in packaging, in plastic packaging. So we have really to do a lot to harvest the possibilities, the potential of biopolymers, of bioplastics to contribute to a more sustainable um, economy and to ideally the circular bioeconomy. Waste management strategy are numerous. Ideally, we can reuse our product and this is the coffee cup, which out of sturdy material, we bring to
to the co coffee uh, of uh, yeah of choice. We get a refill. We drink it. We clean it at home and bring it the next day again. We more often in Europe, at least ten countries have forbidden landfill, which is not an ideal solution. These 10 countries, and the others as well, are putting the emphasis on energy recovery, that we at least get the energy out of the plastic instead of using again coal and oil for electricity generation and heat, that we use the energy from plastics. But we have also the possibilities between the re really good solution of reuse and the really not so good solution of landfill that we do mechanical recycling or chemical recycling. We can use chemical recycling by heat, chemically, enzymatically. I will spend one lecture, hopefully, um, generating some enthusiasm that it's possibly possible to use biological routes to degrade plastics and then use them as a feedstock. And then we have mechanical recycling, closed loop recycling. This is a PET bottle to a PET bottle. Downcycling is we have a PET bottle, but then it's the material, the resin we generate is not of high quality anymore. Then we have to produce, for example, the backing of a carpet. This would be classic downcycling. Upcycling, I also would like to tell you in a lecture, is a possibility, use PET, and produce something which is um, of higher value. And that can be done, for example, by feeding plastic waste to microbes and producing plastic value. Recycling rates in Europe and worldwide, depending how you look at, it's sometimes frustrating or we say we are on a good route to a sustainable society. If we look first, to some numbers in the EU. We have 26 million tons of plastic waste, of which 30% are immediately recycled, 40% are incinerated, at least the energy, energetic recycling is happening, but still 30% is landfilled. In my opinion, this number is far too high and landfill should be forbidden because incineration really works, but we should put more emphasis in reuse and recycling. In Europe, very little of the plastic ends in the environment. You see every now and then the bag, the PET bottle, but more importantly, it's the tires we are losing and we are losing some of our plastic uh, lacquers and colors from buildings and other constructions. These are the major. We also lose some plastics from our washing machine of our clothes. Worldwide, the numbers look really not good. Only 10% are recycled. 14% are incinerated worldwide. 40% at, are at least landfills, so you know where the waste is. But the numbers add up that there's more than 30% of leakage. It's not clear where the waste is. And when you think about the graph I showed you at the beginning of this lecture, one outlet is the ocean. And this is very prominent now in the public media. We really have to change that. And that's why collecting rates, and here as an example of PET bottle, is so important. Starting with the US, focusing mainly on landfill, the PET recycling, so even the collection of PET bottles, bringing it back uh, to that it can be recycled, is less than 30%. Europe-wide, it's 60%, and in a country focusing for quite some time on recycling of PET bottles, it's above 90%. If you look in more detail, there are other countries like Switzerland, they are almost at 100% recycling rate, giving incentives to bring back the PET bottles. What happens if you have at least collected the plastic? 
then we have all the technology in hand. So here we are doing the collection. It should be simple for the user. Sometimes you have to educate it. Then it's getting more difficult. With bottles it's fairly simple. Then sorting. Again with uh, bottles it's very simple. And ideally you make a resin which is of value and then you can make new products out of it which are reused. This would be an, uh, one ideal case. It's not simple because the oil price is very low so this value chain of collecting to reuse is also uh, connected with some cost and with a low oil price making new resin is sometimes cheaper. And the quality to keep it on the same quality, uh, ideally higher, then it's very challenging. We see that plastics have several lives. When you collect, here is an example again of Germany, we, we are saying that uh, we have quite some uh, collection, we have the logistics that we get it collected, then of these collected bottles the recycling is actually uh, fairly high. But you see only 30% uh, are getting again into PET bottles. And this is because of the quality issue. You require at the moment, and it's cheaper at the moment, to use fresh crude oil based resin to produce PET bottles. There's a strong drive for recycling material but price and quality determines the low rate. The textile fiber industry is growing rapidly. I emphasized that in a previous lecture. And we see foils produced and other applications. And then you can think about where the recycled plastic is used to manufacture new products. And this is almost in every part of daily life. Building and construction, I also pointed out in a previous lecture, Packaging as the largest market is important. Automotive. It's not only that they want to have lightweight products, but they also want to get green labels. So recycling material is in high favor, but the automotive industry is one of the most demanding on the quality of the product and on the life uh, of the entire plastic part. So it's very challenging to get into it, but the demand would be there. We have other examples of far easier access. This is the plastic furniture in our garden, as an example. You can then investigate, and I think you have to investigate, to enumerate the impact of your value chain. Is your bioplastic, is your biopolymer indeed contributing to a sustainable uh, future and to the envisioned bioeconomy? Do you really harvest the benefits from fixing the CO2 from the air via plants? Here you get a benefit, so I may, should explain it. Green arrows mean you have a benefit. CO2 capture, for example, from the environment. So from the air and we have CO2 emissions, the black arrows, contributing again to CO2. Obviously the plant grows here, it's in Thailand, sugarcane, and there's a lot of carbon uh, fixed per ton produced. During the production you already release some of the carbon, but interestingly not only the sugar, the sucrose is used, but also the plant material itself. And it's burned to heat up the water to extract the sucrose, but it's also used to heat uh, close entities. Then you have all the time cost for transport. It's very limited, you, you see it here. Here's some four kilogram to transport the sugar to the production plant. In the sugar mill you get actually a benefit because here the plant material is used for producing electricity. And then you go on, you produce in a fermentation your lactate, your lactic acid, 
via some bacterial fermentations. And in a chemical plant, you produce lactide. This lactide is then sold and polylactic acid is produced. And this is the product with the customers. Interestingly enough, this, firm, this company Corbion, producing in Thailand, is a Dutch company going where the carbon source is, very close to the sugarcane field, uses traditionally a fermentation at pH 7. You can imagine if you produce an acid, the pH drops. So you have to add a, a buffer system that you increase and keep the pH stable. And this is via lime. So you need mining the limestone, burning the limestone, and you see there's a huge fraction of CO2 produced. And at the end, you produce gypsum, which is a product maybe in itself, but of low value. What would you do to improve this? So maybe I should close this first. So the footprint of this production is indeed positive. So we reduce the CO2 produced per um, product synthesized via this renewable uh, resource-based synthesis route. How would you improve it now further? An obvious one would be, can we not produce also at low pH and then not requiring these 370 kilograms of CO2 for burning the limestone? And indeed, that's what Corbion is doing. They use pH tolerant bacteria produced at low pH and with this improving the carbon footprint of their lactide produced. With this, I'm at the end of this lecture and thank you for your attention.